Welcome to welcome to day three, session two of the 2003 Emerging Scholars Symposium, a partnership brought to you specifically by the Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower Presidential Libraries, and more broadly by the National Archives and Records Administration, of which the presidential libraries are an important part. The Emerging Scholars Symposium is a program that's going to bring you cutting edge information and insight from a group of scholars uh, who are relatively new to the world of research, scholarship, and presenting their uh, findings on a, a national stage. So we're really getting in on the ground floor of what some of these um, these scholars have uh, been working on. I'm Jeff Urban. I'm speaking to you from the Roosevelt Presidential Library uh, and Museum in Hyde Park. I'll be your host and moderator uh, for this session, and we are pleased to have you joining uh, with us today. If you haven't seen uh, the other presentations this week, uh, you're going to want to check those out. There's been some great information, some wonderful scholars sharing uh, some really insightful um, information with us. I'm, I'm sitting in for my friend and colleague, Joy Murphy, who is the Education Director at the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum, and we are delighted to be bringing you this presentation. This segment is uh, going to feature Jared Frederick. He has a, a BA uh, in history from Penn State. He has an MA in history from uh, West uh, Virginia University, and he is closing in on his PhD uh, from Penn State at uh, Harrisburg. He is currently uh, an assistant uh, teaching professor at Penn State um, at Altoona and um, is working on the final stages of his dissertation. So thank you so much for being with us, Jared. Um, welcome to the uh, to the session and please share with us what you've been working on. Thank you, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and with that, we can dive right into our slides. All right, wonderful. Like so many good research endeavors. Uh, my conversation, the beginnings of this began with a conversation with, that I had with a student. Uh, this student, one of his older neighbors had passed away and he noticed that all of these old newspapers were being heaved into a dumpster. And uh, like any good would-be historian, he went and salvaged a number of them and then he Alternatively, later on, brought those newspapers into the classroom, and they were all newspapers pertaining to the Normandy invasion, and he and I poured through them, and we were truly astounded by the level of detail. These were incredible primary resource, um, various uh, resources that were uh, available to us, and so that began the beginning of a quest. And I started to dig deeper. I started to go through newspaper archives, trying to gather materials like this to incorporate into the classroom. And all in all, I ended up gathering and transcribing over 300,000 words, often in firsthand accounts pertaining to the Normandy invasion. And that ultimately culminated in a book. And I'd like to talk to you about that book and some of the research today. One of the focal points of this research is a basic understanding of the power, the importance, the use, and the symbolism of the free press as it was embraced by the allied nations during the Second World War. And one of the most notable of these correspondents we see here on the opening title slide. His name was Robin Duff, and he was a correspondent with the BBC. I'm going to be introducing you to a number of other correspondents, as well as common GIs and soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force along the way. So let's go ahead and start on this journey together. Next slide, please. Interestingly enough, our story does not begin on the shores of Normandy, but rather in the rain-soaked streets of Austin, Texas. It was very early in the morning on Tuesday, June 6, 1944. There was a heavy thunderstorm hovering over the city, and students from the University of Texas were preparing for their final exams. They were pulling all-nighters. They were struggling to stay awake. 
And then suddenly over the crackle of the radio, they started to hear these initial reports of something that they had been waiting for for a very long time. And that was the announcement that the invasion of France had commenced. And one of the really good firsthand accounts that I was able to uh, gather regarding this was from a student who we see here on the screen whose name was Horace Busby, who appropriately enough later became a speechwriter for President Lyndon Johnson. And what he had to say of this moment when the American people found out through media that the invasion was underway, it encapsulated what so many American towns and towns throughout other allied countries were experiencing in that very fraught and emotional moment. And he said, roommates were rolled out of bed, lights snapped on as fast as a word could be screamed down hallways, telephones began to ring, and a rain-drenched Austin came to life. And I think that's as, as perfect a representation of this very dramatic moment as we can find anywhere. Next slide, please. What I quickly began to uncover is that D-Day, June 6, 1944, was quite possibly the biggest news story of all time. And surely later on, there's the Kennedy assassination, there's the moon landing. All of those were unique and pivotal moments in journalistic history in and of their own right. But neither of those events nor most other events in modern history come as close to the emotional connection of D-Day. And one reason why that is so is because everybody had a personal connection to this event that was transpiring on the shores of Normandy. It seemed that everybody knew somebody who was there. The event was so large in scope, so profound in its implications, people from literally every walk of life were involved in what General Eisenhower referred to as the Great Crusade. And when we think about D-Day through that lens, and we consider its power at this grassroots, organic, hometown level, often being reported of through these mom and pop Main Street newspapers, it really opens up these new opportunities for conversation and trying to truly understand what D-Day meant in the American mind as it was unfolding. And all of these front pages that we see here on the screen, I think are a very vivid testimony uh, to that idea. Next, please. One of the most valuable newspapers that I was able to make use of throughout my research was the Army newspaper Stars and Stripes, which is still in publication to this very day. Uh, in the, the magic of the digital age that we live in, pretty much every issue of Stars and Stripes is available through Ancestry.com or uh, other online venues. And uh, this was a very valuable resource, not only for me as a historian, but it was also a very important outlet for service members as the war was ongoing. Because this was a publication that allowed soldiers to express their ideas, vent their frustrations and their grievances. And we also see some very telling uh, opinion articles and columns uh, showing up in the newspaper at the time. Sometime they are artistic. We can look see the, the fabled GI cartoons and artistry of the likes of Bill Malden, who served in the 45th Infantry Division, and uh, perhaps his most famous uh, piece of artwork shown here of the old cavalryman uh, putting down his old Jeep as an old horseman might uh, put down his trustworthy steed. But there were also opportunities for more serious conversations as well. And right before the invasion, Stars and Stripes laid it down on the line to its readers. And it said, the quest to self-educate will in itself make you a better informed soldier, a better educated American. And in the days ahead, 
when it becomes your job to help decide issues on which the future all depends. Your knowledge of the big picture will make you a better citizen, and in a small way, that will help make this a better world. And in this, we can see how notions of democracy and the free press were integrally tied together. When we think about and compare this to what was happening in fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, who did these dictators often go after first? They went after the free press. Stars and Stripes, therefore, was making this argument that our access to information, our celebration to literacy, our accessibility to a free and open and hopefully honest and transparent press is what sets us apart from our totalitarian enemies. What Stars and Stripes is saying to its GI readers is that this is what you are fighting for. And that is a very profound statement when we consider what is on the line. Next, please. One person, a correspondent who tried to ring this bell early on, was a Prussian-born reporter by the name of Otto Tolschus. And he had been stationed in Berlin in 1940, 1941, in the the build-up to America's entry into the war. And he tried to paint a picture for American readers about what exactly was going on in Nazi Germany, especially when it came to the press and access to information. And he wrote, a liberty is beside the point in a land that spurns it and which sought to build a new world on an entirely different foundation. He, in this country, who flayed the foe most and cheered his own cause loudest, was the one that often emerged triumphant. And therefore, his argument was, is that we as Americans cannot allow the loudness, the volume of radicalism to drown out our rationale and ability to think like common, decent citizens in a representative government and a democratic society. So here too, we get another very stark interpretation of what is on the line. Next, please. One of the most famous correspondents, of course, once America does enter the Second World War in a more formal sense, is none other than Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle was this rather unassuming reporter from the state of Indiana, and he had gained a reputation throughout the 1930s for finding the voice of the common man, especially as the Great Depression was underway. And his various adventures took him to the likes of Alaskan gold camps and California garbage dumps. And his interest was not necessarily in the thoughts or exploits of generals or politicians, but rather your everyday citizen. And he tried to invoke that same sort of philosophy when it came to reporting the war in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, the Air War, England, and ultimately Normandy itself. In 1944, he would earn the Pulitzer Prize for his depictions of the so-called dog-faced soldier. Uh, He really offered this uh, foxhole perspective to American readers. And he became one of the most widely read journalists in American society in consequence. Uh, His writings were picked up by 400 daily newspapers. He's read by millions of Americans on a weekly basis. And uh, many of those writings are subsequently turned into books. And then at the very end of the war, unfortunately, shortly after Ernie Pyle himself is killed in the Pacific, is made into a movie as well. GIs appreciated not only reading Ernie Pyle's columns, but they also grew a love for reading through some of the compact books that were known as armed service editions. And we can see two such examples here, perhaps the most popular of them, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, uh, 
which was an exceedingly popular book uh, for GIs during the war. Um, these were small, compactly printed books that were a little bit larger than uh, oversized index cards. And uh, soldiers passed them around like crazy. They could easily fit in your M43 uniform pocket. You could shove it in your helmet liner. And even if these books were often shredded to pieces, they would still be passed around. And as one service member later recounted, to throw one of these valued, cherished books away, he said was tantamount to slapping your grandmother in the face. And so GIs had a real love of reading and learning because it was often one of the few things that they could do in their downtime. Little surprise to us then that so many of these same GIs made use of the GI Bill of Rights to further their education and their learning in the years after the war. And so it's an interesting way for us to connect the dots. Next slide, please. Another very accomplished writer who became a correspondent during the war years was none other than John Steinbeck. And uh, to even a greater extent than Ernie Pyle, John Steinbeck uh, had this populist voice of the people in a lot of his writings. There was Of Mice and Men, there was The Grapes of Wrath, uh, so on and so forth. And he had a particular affinity for Ernie Pyle's style of writing. And uh, this is what he had to say about that. He said, there is the war of the homesick, weary, funny, violent, common men who wash their socks in their helmets, complain about the food, whistle at the girls, and bring themselves through as dirty a business as the world has ever seen, and they do it with humor and dignity and courage. And that is Ernie Pyle's war. And so I think that's as uh, concise and as fitting an assessment of what Ernie Pyle was all about. Uh, and certainly John Steinbeck, uh, did a great service to American readers as well. Uh, this was a man who went on B-17 flights. He went on secret missions with the Office of Strategic Services. He himself was wounded in combat. Uh, and so like Ernie Pyle, he was not above putting himself in harm's way. Next. Much the same could also be said for uh, future celebrated television journalists in the form of Andy Rooney and Walter Cronkite, uh, who we see depicted here. Andy Rooney got his start in journalism through Stars and Stripes, and he too went on a number of 8th Air Force missions over Nazi-occupied Europe, and uh, that culminated in his first book, which he co-authored with one of his comrades, and that book was called Air Gunner. Andy Rooney also was, he, also, he learned how to be observant, I think is the best way to look at it. Uh, he would go to press briefings, which involved Dwight Eisenhower. He learned to listen. He learned how to take notes. He learned how to emphasize what was important, and he was he was like a sponge. He was absorbing all of this uh, journalistic learning from the colleagues who were to his left and right. Um, he would also write about these comical aspects, um, including this particular breed of American GI who was known as a Piccadilly Commando. Um, and that was a GI who was on the prowl for prostitutes in the streets of London when a lot of these service members were on leave. Um, and so much like he did uh, later on with his uh, televised editorials, um, he often had the ability to mix the profound and the comedic, oftentimes in the same pieces. Uh, Walter Cronkite, meanwhile, who we see here on the right, uh, went on numerous missions with the U.S. 8th Air Force. And what he learned that it was almost impossible not to become emotionally attached to his subject matter. He wrote a heartbreaking article entitled Nine Crying Boys in a Flying Fort. This is a mission that he had witnessed, and the beloved 26-year-old captain of this American plane uh, 
became the victim of the single bullet to hit that aircraft. And it was a bullet that killed him. And in this very sorrowful reflection, Cronkite writes about witnessing the remains of this beloved captain being taken away from his aircraft as all nine of his crewmates stood there crying. And Cronkite admitted that I cried too. And so it truly became impossible for a lot of these individuals to detach themselves from the stories as journalists are often instructed to do. Next slide, please. One of the really great things that surprised me as I was conducting this research is that I never before had known just how pivotal D-Day and all of its implications were to the ongoing civil rights movement in 1940s America and overseas. Of course, the United States military is still segregated at this point. It would be for another four years. Over a million African Americans serve in uniform during this conflict. And suffice it to say, they were greatly disappointed with how they were institutionally treated by the military. Um, but they were relieved to an extent when many of them found themselves in England because they found that there was no Jim Crow in British civilian life. Uh, there were no color barriers when they visited London in many cases. And the greatest hurdles that they had to overcome, even before they confronted the Nazis, was and sometimes their own white comrades. And as one uh, black GI noted on this matter, he said, we black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. One periodical that became the champion for such service members who were demanding further rights was the Pittsburgh Courier. This was the most widely read African-American newspaper in the States at that time. It had a distribution of something like a quarter of a million. And the Pittsburgh Courier initiated what was known as the Double V Campaign. And what that suggested is if black troops serve honorably overseas, if they further prove that they are worthy of the rights of citizenship, then that will allow us as African-Americans to further our cause in regard to equality when so many of these service members come home. And so here too, we should not be at all surprised to see this much more robust civil rights movement emerging in the late 1940s and into the 1950s and beyond. All of these things are most definitely connected. Next, please. The same can also be said to an extent for women who found themselves in uniform, especially so, for female correspondents. And they often had to overcome these barriers in two different realms. Uh, and not only did they had to navigate their way through this male-dominated establishment of military hierarchy, but a media and the world of journalism was structured in a very similar way. And I think one of the most notable correspondents in this regard is the woman who we see in the bottom right-hand corner of our screen, and her name is Martha Gellhorn. And she insisted to her editors that she had to find herself in the combat zone. She said, it is necessary that I report on this war. It is necessary that I see for those who cannot see for themselves. Very poignant words as we consider them. One of her greatest hurdles, though, came from within her own magazine, Collier's Weekly, and uh, that hurdle was her own husband, who was Ernest Hemingway, who we see in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And uh, they were not only husband and wife, but they were also competitors working for <laughs> the same publication. Uh, and so the two of them uh, developed this fierce rivalry about who would get to the shores of Normandy first and who would beat the other one to the punch, who would have the better scoop on what was bound to be the biggest story of the 20th century. We'll find out in a little bit who ultimately wins that race. Next, please. One of the other big questions that emerged in the buildup to D-Day is what exactly does D-Day mean 
what does that D in front of day represent? And so many people wrote to their local newspapers. Um, and many people also wrote to the United States War Department. And Secretary of War Henry Stimson finally put the issue to rest. And he said that the D itself actually stands for day. So uh, D minus 20 is D is 20 days before D day. And so um, there's been a lot of conversation about this, but the D actually stands for day. And therefore D day actually means day day. It is the day, the day of invasion. But in the mind of General Henry Hap Arnold, who was the Air Force's chief in Europe at that time, uh, he made this rather firm declaration to American reporters. And he said, we are invading, not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. He knows if he cannot stop us, he's licked. Uh, and in so saying this, Hap Arnold was making the argument that the invasion isn't beginning when we first put our boots on the shores of some distant occupied country. It is beginning. The clock is already ticking, and the U.S. 8th Air Force had a very deadly toll inflicted on it in the effort to achieve as much. Next slide, please. As that clock continued ticking, tensions were becoming heightened. People were wondering about what was next. Where would the invasion strike? That was the big question in everybody's mind. Everybody knew this momentous thing was going to happen, but they didn't know exactly when or where. And certainly they didn't know how it would play out either. The photograph that we see in the background is a very revealing one because it shows us this huge logistical process that was unfolding here in the days before D-Day. And one journalist by the name of Ivan Peterman uh, wrote what I think are some of the, the best words to describe uh, this huge industrial process and how he was describing it to American readers back home is that he categorized it as a mechanical Niagara. And he encouraged readers to think of Niagara Falls and the power and the force of water and nature. But rather, instead of thinking about water, he said, picture all of these trucks and crates and vehicles and tanks and cranes and ships and everything else imaginable. And just think about this endless flow of material goods being shipped from point A to point B. And it's really evocative and effective language. Um, most people were not seeing the imagery of this, even on newsreels at the time. And much like reporter Edward Murrow found out in his overseas radio broadcast, um, you had to be a little bit more eloquent in how you were describing the scene if you truly wanted to get the picture across to either listeners or readers. Next. I think this is also true to an extent for one of the most experienced of D-Day reporters, whose name was Don Whitehead, who wrote for the Associated Press. And he had gone through a number of invasions up until this point. And uh, here are some of the words of caution that he received from a general. Uh, while, and Don Whitehead was standing alongside correspondent John Thompson as he received these words of advice. And the general told these two reporters who were embedding themselves with his unit, he said, you both know how to take care of yourselves and won't forget to duck. But if an unlucky shell should get you, we'll do all we can. If you're wounded, we'll take care of you. If you're killed, we'll bury you. Meantime, we'll feed you. And these seem to be the only sure guarantees that somebody like Don Whitehead could receive as that clock ticked ever closer to June 6th, 1944. Next. One of the most important people of all, of course, and the calculation for all of this was the Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, and some reporters said that it seemed like each of those four stars on his shoulder weighed a ton. This, this was the glorious burden of command that had been placed upon him. And as reporter Ann O'Hare McCormick uh, recounted during all of this, she said, never has the fate of so many depended on the judgment of so few. Uh, 
and a very famous uh, document pertaining to Eisenhower that we can find in the National Archives is this June 5th letter of guilt, this letter of admission. In the case that the Normandy invasion fell flat on its face and it failed, Eisenhower scribbled this very rudimentary letter that would to be released to the press in which he accepts full guilt, full blame for the failure, that, that the failure rested completely upon his shoulders. And I think this is the epitome of leadership, uh, recognizing somebody who was willing not only to acknowledge success, but also to take responsibility for failure. And of course, the, the one fascinating bit of psychology that we can get from all of this is that he puts the wrong month on that letter and very famously puts July 5th instead of June 5th. And it very much gives us a little bit of insight, I think, into his uh, psychological well-being as all of this was about to explode. Next, please. Uh, luckily for us, what ended up on the front pages of American newspapers was not that note, but this one. And this was Eisenhower's order of the day. And truly, it was on the front page of every American periodical, almost without fail, on June 6, 1944. And really, I think the, the way for us to think about it is that it's the 1940s equivalent of the Gettysburg Address. In this very concise declaration of purpose, Eisenhower underscores and acknowledges the fact that we've gone through difficulty, but the tide has turned, and now we are going to press onward to victory. It is this moral statement of clarity that is truly one of the most compelling documents of American history of the 20th century. And uh, given how well-versed Eisenhower was in the history of the American Civil War, I have no doubt that he took inspiration from the Gettysburg Address in writing that iconic document. Next, please. Just a little bit of geographic overview here I think would be helpful as we proceed. There are, of course, five Allied beachheads. Two of them are American sectors, two of them are British sectors, and there is also a Canadian sector. Uh, the span of the beaches stretches about 60 miles in total, and on those 60 miles of Normandy coast, beginning on June 6th, Approximately 150,000 Allied troops will be going ashore. They are seeking to crack the Atlantic Wall, establish a beachhead, and this will be foundational in Eisenhower's hopes for paving the way toward ultimate victory in Europe. So a little bit of geographic overview here, I think, of course, is helpful for moving ahead. Next. The earliest phases of this operation consisted of 13,000 paratroopers and glider men from various nationalities landing behind enemy lines. Uh, this is the stuff of legends. It's incredibly frightful and terrifying as well. These are people who had 100 pounds of gear strapped to themselves. They're jumping into pitch black darkness. There are people shooting at them. They are being misdropped. And it's from these instances where listeners and readers across the sea will have their very first reports. They will get a sense of what is unfolding on the ground level. And we'll head to the next slide to hear about one such person who was playing a role in all of that. His name was William Walton, and he worked for Time Magazine. This is a man who had very little military training. He only had one or two practice jumps uh, with the paratroopers. Uh, but he nonetheless realized that that is where the action was going to be. And uh, he flung himself right into the middle of all of that uh, deadly violence within Normandy's hedgerows. And of this situation, he said, snipers were still taking a wham at us every now and then. Half of our equipment was gone, but my typewriter was waterproofed and I still have it. And we have this wonderful photograph of William Walton here in his uh, parachute equipment, with the C for correspondent painted on his helmet and the very small portable typewriter that he is carrying with him. Uh, and so perhaps in some instances in this regard, uh, maybe the pen is mightier than the sword. Next. One of the other really revealing things 
as we look at other sections of period newspapers at the time, the advertising in periodicals was also aligned with D-Day. And here's a, a really interesting page from a Michigan newspaper. Uh, and we can see all of the local stores and businesses uh, sending out their messages of support. And these were advertisements that were created and prepared and formatted months, weeks before the invasion was announced. And so it was this moment of anticipation and uh, newspapers saw an opportunity here to, to gain advertising revenue from D-Day as well, because they realized everybody was going to be buying a newspaper. And they were telling local businesses, you don't want to miss out on this advertising coup because everybody will be buying a periodical. And this is your opportunity to not only promote your business, but also send warm wishes to those involved in the invasion. So these are things that we very rarely think about when we think about the broad scope of how D-Day is being felt within American society. Next, please. Among the first troops to land in Normandy from the amphibious standpoint are the men of the 4th Infantry Division. And all in all, the men of the 4th Infantry Division felt that they weren't getting the amount of press that was due to them and uh, this led to some of them to writing letters of anger to Stars and Stripes, essentially saying, hey, what about us? And Stars and Stripes later wrote of this pattern that the boys of the Ivy Division heard that a lot of people were getting credit for the Allied advance in France. That is almost everybody but the fourth. And this, too, is very revealing, and it underscores the importance of the press in the eyes of American service members, because there was this firm belief among GIs that if they were fighting, if they were doing well, if they were advancing, then by God, they better be getting credit for it in the newspapers. And if they weren't, they were going to let those newspapers know about it. And so here too, another sublime example of just how important these newspapers were to men and women in uniform. Next, please. Perhaps one reason why Utah Beach is so overshadowed is because of the far bigger bloodletting where some 2,000 casualties will be inflicted on Omaha Beach a little bit further down the coast. And here, correspondents like Robert Kappa, he snaps these very iconic photographs, one like we see here of waterlogged GIs, which became the visual inspiration for the opening scenes of Saving Private Ryan, I might add. And uh, not too far away is Associated Press reporter Don Whitehead. And Whitehead said that no matter where you walked, there were people falling. No matter where you ran to, it seemed like something was blowing up or erupting. It was this vortex of violence that he said was hotter than hell, and it was absolutely inescapable. And ultimately, only by sheer manpower and force of will, where uh, little squads and platoons here and there are making headway and cracking the German defenses, were the Americans finally able to overcome a lot of this violence. And the likes of Don Whitehead was there to report it. Next, please. Uh, so was the correspondent Martha Gellhorn as well, who did in fact beat her husband, Ernest Hemingway, uh, to being the first one to step on Normandy shores. But she was so overcome with uh, a lot of the, the visuals, the scenery, the, the horrors of war, that she had to temporarily put down her pen and her typewriter, and she felt morally compelled to instead uh, help and assist with all of the wounded who were being brought uh, aboard a lot of these medical transport vessels. And she said that nurses were toiling like demons, and she also admitted, it will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. There was no time to talk. There was too much else to do. And so for as uh, fierce and determined a correspondent as Martha Gellhorn was, I think it's very revealing that in this moment that she, she put her professional ambitions aside because she was so overcome with what she was seeing here on the beaches of Normandy. Uh, and to my understanding, she became the first female correspondent to step foot on Normandy's shores. And she did so on the evening 
of June 6th itself. So a, a very fascinating story, um, one not only of rivalry, but heroism as well. Next, please. Correspondent Ernie Pyle uh, was on one of those ships watching the invasion unfold. Uh, he, though, did not get onto the beach itself until June 7th, D plus one. That certainly, though, did not diminish the invasion's impact on his soul or his writing. And in one of the finest pieces that he wrote during the war, Pyle recognized this horrible waste of war. And he, he wrote in this moment, on the beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. They were gone forever now, and yet we could afford it. And this really speaks to the, the mindset that American military planners were embracing. Uh, this idea of quantity over quality, that we're just going to, we're going to win this thing by sheer force of will and numbers. But Pyle also had this talent for considering the human cost of it all. And a lot of the bodies had already been cleared off the beach, not all though, certainly, but he recognized this, this other form of wreckage all over the sands. And he said there were pens and rosary beads and journals and diaries with pages that would never be filled. There was a guitar. There was a tennis racket. There was a stray dog who was uh, wandering around the beach looking for its master. And in presenting this, this image of, of tangible debris of war left on the beachhead. He was able to just as effectively convey the story of human loss as if he was looking at corpses themselves. Um, so I definitely encourage any of you to, to check out some of his writing here in the immediate wake of D-Day. It's incredibly powerful stuff. Next, please. Uh, my book also takes a look at how D-Day was experienced on the home front. Uh, and uh, really, it was it was just one of these all-consuming moments of, of the war on, on the domestic front. Uh, businesses closed. People went to church. Places of worship were open 24 hours a day, much like the synagogue that we see here in New York City. There was a sense of unanimity. There was this belief that we're all in this together. It was a day of prayer. It was a day of celebration. Uh, people decided to work extra shifts at the factory or their jobs. Uh, there were Red Cross blood drives. Uh, recruitment uh, went up for a, a short time spell. Um, it was this incredible moment of togetherness. And you really get a strong sense of that when you read all of these interactions and firsthand accounts in the period newspapers of the time. Next, please. Only a few blocks away from that synagogue, uh, throngs of people gathered in Times Square, and they were looking up at the, the, the ticker board, um, the news uh, coming across the screens. And as these photos would suggest, these were photographs taken by the Office of War Information, uh, people just stood or sat there transfixed, sometimes for hours at a time, hanging on to every little bit of news that was coming their way. And in these early phases, the news was incredibly vague, uh, but people uh, stood there in a trance uh, nonetheless. Uh, and, and this too speaks to the power and the anticipation of D-Day as it was felt at home. Next slide, please. We also get a sense of that in Central Park in New York City, where these large loudspeakers were set up. And uh, we, we can see that here and there's demonstrations taking place and we see the flags of allied countries. There's see, see the Soviet flag, the American flag, the British flag, the Mexican flag. And so it was not only a moment of domestic togetherness, but there was also this sense of international accord associated with the moment as well. Um, the Soviet Union, as much as anybody, was incredibly relieved that D-Day had finally arrived. Joseph Stalin had been pushing for the opening of a second front in Western Europe. 
to relieve his battle-strained uh, Russian troops for years by this point. Um, and so even though victory was not a foregone conclusion, on the world stage, among the Allied countries, there was this collective sigh of relief um, that perhaps, just maybe, this is the beginning of the end. Next, please. All of this said, there's, there's not always a sense of togetherness. And to go back to the themes of various uh, civil rights incidents tied in with all of this, in Ohio, in Cincinnati particularly, there was what was known as the D-Day strike. This was a labor strike that overlapped with the Normandy invasion, and it occurred at a Wright Aeronautical plant because a small number of African-American workers were hired to work in the sheet metal shop. And all of this was to the great frustration and anger of their white colleagues in this war factory. And in resistance to the hiring of these African-American workers, the white employees walked off the job, the plant shut down, all because the factory was being integrated. And so think about all the plane parts that were not being produced and were being, going to be needed for this ongoing campaign. And uh, to its credit, the Cincinnati Post said, you right workers, what will you say to the fathers and mothers of those men who fall in France? Uh, and so here, too, this was something unexpected that I was not anticipating uh, in finding uh, about news articles from the spring of 1944. Uh, and the same can be said for what we'll find on our next slide here as well. Um, something that very much caught me off guard is that in the year 1944, uh, the hate organization, the Ku Klux Klan, dissolved. Apparently, many of its members were in the military service. Its membership was involved in other realms of the war effort. Uh, and this was something that gained a lot of headlines in 1944. And it, it promoted this idea that maybe democracy is winning that we are defeating hate overseas and at home as well. And a lot of newspapers had very sharp words to say about this situation. And the Benton Harbor News Palladium said a few days after the invasion, probably Adolf Hitler never heard of the Ku Klux Klan, but the Klan and Hitler's Nazi party were blood relations. And of course, the Pittsburgh Courier, that civil rights-minded newspaper, in Pennsylvania, said on the Normandy beachhead on D-Day, whom did the white soldier from Georgia or Florida fear the more, the armed Negro beside him or the German who is white like himself? And that presented a degree of logic that was difficult for many people to argue with. And so there are all these fascinating uh, ripple effects of D-Day. Uh, especially in regard to the civil rights movement. And it, it certainly adds a whole other perspective of a way for us to think about D-Day's meaning. Next, please. Another degree of controversy that comes about uh, during the time of D-Day was the proposal of the so-called Taft Amendment. And uh, this was something that was spearheaded by the son of former President Taft, who had uh, since become a United States senator. And uh, Robert Taft, in essence, proposed this idea that would curtail reading material that could be mailed to overseas troops. And his rationale in proposing this amendment was that he was worried that FDR Democrats were going to flood GI mail and periodicals and readings with democratic propaganda that would coerce them into voting for FDR for an unparalleled fourth term. Um, and this was something that was uh, fiercely uh, ridiculed and attacked among service members. And, uh, and as well as in civilian newspapers. And the one newspaper that we see here from Indiana said the Taft Amendment raises the question whether American soldiers are children or adults. If they are adults, the Taft Amendment ought to be amended. And then one uh, military writer writing for the Infantry Journal um, interpreted the law as 
a petty campaign to bar any and every scrap of printed material which might be favorable to the Roosevelt administration. And in reading all of this, we once again get a sense of just how important the written word and access to information is to these troops. Uh, and so uh, these are conversations that I think in many ways remain relevant today. Where do we get our information? Are we capable of analyzing that information? Uh, these questions were very much in mind in 1944 as well. Next slide, please. As we uh, start to wrap things up, uh, one story that was especially evocative in my mind that was reported about in Stars and Stripes was a ceremony that happened exactly two weeks after D-Day in which soldiers of the 101st Airborne Division, um, a number of them were awarded silver stars and other decorations for their recent heroics, and they gathered in the, the town square of Carentan, France, this important Normandy crossroads community. And what I found so effective in this journalism was not the description of the ceremony itself, but what the paratroopers did afterwards. They were treated to a movie showing of the recently released MGM comedy, Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble. And how the reporter described the situation is that these battle-hardened men were kids again. They were laughing, they were enjoying each other's camaraderies, they were making cat calls, they were slapping each other on the back, and all of this was happening even as the, the din of the distant guns could still be heard. And as the, uh, as a way for us to think about this is that for so many of them, it was the last movie that they ever saw because there were still so many battles yet left to fight. Um, but many of them were correct in their assumption that this was the beginning of the end. This was one of the great turning points of the war. Next slide, please. Even... 75 to 80 years onward, though, we can still consider the human costs of all of it. Um, as we saw just this week, as we commemorated the 79th anniversary of D-Day, on every major news network, there were interviews and stories featured about World War II veterans and their family members and what this war and what this invasion means for so many of them yet. And one very compelling story that happened right before the 75th anniversary of D-Day involved these two twin brother sailors by the name of Henry and Louis Piper, who were on an LST ship that was struck by an enemy mine, and both of these brothers were killed at age 19. Both of them, born on the same day, end up dying on the same day as well. And for well over 70 years, the brothers were separated. One of them was presumed to be lost at sea. But then in this miracle through research and forensic data, the brothers are reunited and they are reburied in the Normandy American Cemetery by nieces and nephews who they had never even met. Uh, this too, it was something that received considerable headlines as it occurred. And it speaks to the, the power of personal stories. And that power was evoked in 1944, and every anniversary that we commemorate D-Day, we still see glimpses of that. We still seek that very profound human connection. Next slide, please. When one goes to the Normandy American Cemetery at colville sur mer overlooking Omaha Beach, and we look over the 9,400 tombstones of American dead. This accounts for less than 2% of the total number of Americans who die in the war, and an even a more minuscule number of people who die in the war as a whole, somewhere around 65 million. And it begs the question, what do we owe the dead? And in our next slide here, Dwight Eisenhower himself tried to answer that. And he made a pledge, and it was tied in with the freedom of the press. And he said, our countries fight best when our people are best informed. 
I should feel disturbed if I thought that I or my public relations staff were held as anything but friends of the press. I will never tell you anything false. The limitations of war did not always allow Eisenhower to openly tell the truth, but he indeed made a pledge that he would never lie about the conduct of the war. And I think by and large, he remains true to that conviction. And as we go to our next slide, he reflects 20 years onward when he revisits Normandy with CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite. He is sitting there overlooking that same Normandy cemetery. And he very stoically says, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray that humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And I think in so many ways, that remains the, the great task for all of us all of these years later. How do we assess the news and world happenings around us? And I think Eisenhower would make the claim that being informed, having an awareness of what is happening in the world, is perhaps one of the only ways to ensure that such a conflict on this catastrophic scale can never happen again. And indeed, he was right. These people did give us a chance. And 80 years onward, the question is pressed upon us, what are we going to do with that chance? That is the question for the ages. Next and final slide, please. Many of these stories and more are in my book, Dispatches of D-Day. This was a passion project that took well over two years to research and to write. And if you are interested in learning more about many of the stories and other stories uh, that I talked about in uh, this presentation, the book may be of interest to you. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm happy to field any questions that any of you may have. And I thank the presidential libraries for having me for this presentation today. Great. Well, thank you, Jared. And thank you for leaving us with um with a challenge really, you know, that we have to pick up the mantle where, um, you know, these folks that, that uh, gave so much during the World War um, and, and bought us that time as, as President or General Eisenhower said, um, you know, the task is up to us now. We are linked uh, to that. And even 10 or, 10 or 20 years from now when folks that were engaged in, in the conflict have, have all gone, um, I think that that, that charge will still, uh, Will still live with us. So, so thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, I'm I'm interested. I had heard, and I, I don't know if this is a rumor or this is true, but you know, with all the you know 300,000 words that you've looked at um, uh, in your you know in your research for your book, I had heard that um, there was a in the New York Times um, crossword puzzle that there were words like Juno and sword and those things were were appearing, and somebody noticed that, and somebody was was worried that it was this some kind of a code that was, you know, somebody on the inside knew when they were sending a message out to other folks. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, it, it is a true story. Uh, I believe it was in a British newspaper and I, I believe the crossword puzzle, it had been assembled by a, a British school teacher, if memory serves correctly, for years and years and years before World War II even started. And Allied Intelligence actually went and picked this guy up and grilled him quite heavily over all of these words that were being featured in his crossword puzzles that he was putting together. And as it turned out, it was absolute coincidence that he was using Overlord and Omaha and all of these other uh, phrases that were associated with the invasion. Um, and so he had a rather scary encounter, but was ultimately uh, left off the hook. So um, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction and when we think about coincidental stories as such. Oh, absolutely. And um, you mentioned that uh, the, uh, the Eisenhower orders of the day 
were uh, printed in the uh, in the newspaper. What about the D-Day prayer, um, which uh, President Roosevelt read to the nation um, as the action was was going on? Uh, any any insight on that? Absolutely. Uh, that was uh, as well as Eisenhower's speech. Uh, both of them were featured heavily in multimedia formats. Uh, for both of them, of course, they were both addressed over the radio. They were both delivered over the radio, and then they were thereafter reprinted in American newspapers. And both of those documents combined, I very much think were perceived as American scripture. Uh, because on one hand, you have this statement of purpose that Eisenhower is delivering, and then you also have this very meaningful prayer uh, that was uh, delivered by Franklin Roosevelt as well. Uh, and so I, m many Americans saw those two statements conjoined as offering a real moment of moral clarity as to what we are doing, why we are doing it, why the war still needs to be won. And um, the Roosevelt speech is, is very unique and a little bit different in contrast to Eisenhower's. Eisenhower's is very concise. Um, the FDR's prayer um, is a little bit more in length. And, and Roosevelt, uh, to my knowledge, didn't deliver such uh, long homilies as such. He often didn't deliver prayers in, in such a long, formal manner. Uh, but I think he very much realized the weight of the moment and wanted to reflect upon it accordingly. So uh, both of those are most definitely featured prominently in American media, whether it be printed or audio. Excellent. I think what's also interesting, you know, that I, I think we need to keep in mind is, you know, today, if something were to happen during this during this presentation, my phone would go off, I'd pull it out, and I could see what was going on anywhere in the world. And the time that we're talking about um, now, D-Day, of course, you're going to hear about it just a few hours later because of the radio and that sort of thing. But much of the news folks got in those days was sometimes two, three, four days old, a week old, two weeks old. How did that play into the ability to process as opposed to, you know, um, I think about like the attack at, at Pearl Harbor. You know, mm -hmm. President Roosevelt had a whole day to think about what he wanted to say and what he wanted to do. So he doesn't address the nation until the next day. Then I think about 9-11. You know, President uh, Bush was reading to fourth graders in Sarasota, Florida. They whisper in his ear. They whisper in his ear a second time. He walks off the stage and everybody's expecting him to have a statement and to know what, what's going on. So how, how does it, can you speak a little bit to the, the ability, you know, you say we have to analyze and, and you know, uh, and take a look at this information, but how do we do it when it happens so fast and so quickly? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think the the rate at which information was being forwarded to readers and consumers depended entirely upon where a correspondent was stationed at any one given time. Uh, many correspondents hopped on planes and uh, bombers who were going to drop their payloads or they were on C-47s with paratroopers. And they were vigorously taking notes and sometimes even doing broadcasts as they were in transit. And then the planes returned to England and they could polish up their reports and they could send it out over the wire. And uh, it, it took only minutes for the wire to send news from London to New York City. Um, things were very much being accelerated and speeded up as far as the dissemination of news goes by 1944. If you contrast that, though, with people like William Walton, who were essentially living off the grid for three or four days, um, working his way through this uh, bewildered battlescape, um, it takes him a lot longer to find somebody to give his briefs to, to find a radio, to find some means to communicate his information back across uh, the English Channel. So it all depended on circumstances and placement. Um, if you were in the newsroom in London or you hopped a flight back to England after seeing the opening phases of it, if you were on a ship, um, you could get news out pretty quickly. Um, but if you were with mm -hmm. the frontline grunts, uh, that's where things could be a little bit prolonged and a little bit more difficult. So it, it depends entirely on uh, 
where, where individuals were stationed at any one given time. So let's talk just a few minutes about you. So you got this idea from the student who was rummaging through the uh, the dumpster next door. Um, what would you have worked on? And you said, and then you said it became a, a you know a a, a passion, a, you know, a, a work of passion for two years. What would you have worked on if if that student had decided to skip class that day? <laughs> that's a, great, that's a, a great question, um, and I'm not entirely sure. I've I've since gone on to write a few more books. Uh, on the Second World War, but this story was really foundational for everything else I've written since. And what it revealed to me, and I, I think this uh, speaks to the value of what you all do within the National Archives and the Presidential Libraries, and that's the eternal value of primary sources and access to archival documents. Because if I had tried to write this book 20 years ago, when the internet was in its infancy and before so many of these things had been digitized, I simply wouldn't have been able to do it. Uh, I would have had to have gone to dozens of historical societies, rolled the dice, gone through microfiche, try to find all of these things uh, on, on a wing and a prayer, and it, it just wouldn't have worked. Uh, and so I think it really speaks to the exciting times that we live in as historians where more and more things are becoming more and more accessible. And it really allows us to paint new interpretations. Uh, specifically, how was all of this reported in the news? Um, and one of the things that constantly surprised me uh, is just how often the service members were writing home they were talking about their experiences. They were writing to their folks and their folks handed those letters over to the local newspapers. And all of these were completely uncensored. The amount of, uh, of violence and detail featured in some of them. I thought, man, their battalion commanders aren't doing their jobs. I'm not censoring yeah. the mail accordingly. Uh, but it, it just really speaks to, I, I think, the value of what we try to do as historians and what you all try to do as public historians um, working at, at these very valuable repositories of our national past. So I, I thank you all for what you do as well. Thank you. So um, you're, you're wrapping up your dissertation and what comes next? Well, my dissertation is on the, the history of the Gettysburg battlefield during World War II, uh, how that site was both physically and symbolically used by the American people and the federal government uh, during that conflict. And I, I think it'll be really surprising to a lot of readers. It's, it's been quite the eye-opening journey for me. Um, but after that, I would, uh, I'd really like to revisit the American Revolution or uh, the Civil War, um, the two conflicts that really sparked my interest in history at, at a very young age. Um, I, I've kept a a notebook of book ideas ever since I was in high school. And there's a lot of ideas in that book by this point. Um, so I have uh, no, no shortage of material or ideas to work with in the forthcoming years. Great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jared, for being with us. Good luck with uh, all your future projects. Let's hope you can uh, work through that notebook of, of book ideas. Uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of fun doing it and we'll all be better off for it as well. So thanks for being with us and, and good luck with all of that. Thank you so very much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thanks so much, folks, for joining us this week with the uh, Emerging Scholars uh, program here, the partnership between the uh, Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower Presidential Libraries. This wraps up our 2023 uh, edition. And, um, you know, we look forward to uh, serving you all in the future uh, at the three individual presidential libraries and through the National Archives. And, um, as we saw in several of these uh, presentations, it's so important, so important to find out where we've been so that we can get a sense of where we're going. So keep up the scholarship, all of you uh, out there who are working um, and presenting for us, and we will keep up uh, finding out information and keeping up with the news as has been suggested all this week. That's really, really important, and we wanna thank um, the uh, uh, Roosevelt Presidential Library, the Truman Library, and especially the Eisenhower Library, uh, who uh, did the, the bulk of the work putting this uh, all together uh, for us uh, this year. So thanks much, and we will see you again very soon. Bye-bye.